So this first, uh, this first topic we're going to talk about is functions. We're going to start with a definition. That definition is of a set. We say a set is a list of mathematical objects where no object repeats. In this class, when we talk about mathematical objects, we're mostly probably going to be talking about numbers and ordered pairs, but you could have, you know, sets of shapes or many other things. Um, but in this course, we're really limiting our discussion to sets of numbers or sets of ordered pairs. What I want to do next is talk a bit about notation. So what are the mathematical symbols we use to kind of represent a set? So when we talk about a set, we usually name our set with a capital letter. So for example, set A. And say I want to talk about the set of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. So I would say A is equal to, and then to indicate that the list that I'm about to write down is a set as opposed to just a list of things, I'm going to use this curly bracket. And if my list is just three things or four things like this, I can list them and then close my list with another curly bracket. So a set like this that we can describe by just enumerating the numbers inside of it has a, as a name, this is called a finite set. So if I can actually write down all of the elements or all of the things, all the numbers that are inside of our set, we would say that kind of set is finite. So, for example, if I were to list, or if my set was the students in this class, that's finite. I could list the 22 names of the students in my class, and I would be at the end, right? What if I wanted to list all the weights in between 100 pounds and 200 pounds? Is that finite? Are you sure? Okay, so I could start with 100 pounds, right? What would come next? What about 100.1? What about 100.01? What about 100.001? So are, are you stir, still sure that's fine? that list is finite? Now it starts to sound pretty infinite, right? Because you can see that I can go on coming up with a new weight, increasing the decimal for as long as I'd like, right? So things that are kind of continuous, you know, like you can, like a height or a weight, um, typically are going to be infinite. And since we can't write down that entire list, we need to come up with a different notation to use in that sort of situation. So let's show you guys how to do that. This will be how we write down an infinite set. So we start the same way. We're going to give the set a name with a capital letter. I'm going to call this set, set B. And then I'll write equals, and I'll start with this curly bracket. Now, if we're talking about the weights between 100 and 200 pounds, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a variable to describe what that weight is, and I'm going to write a rule that describes the things inside of that set. So I'm going to say this is the set of x's. And I'm going to draw a vertical line. We read this vertical line as the words such that. Uh, we could also use a colon there. Sometimes people use a colon instead of a vertical line. When I say colon, I just mean the two dots. And now we're going to write our rule. 
So we need to say that x is between 100 and 200. Everybody okay with that idea? We should also indicate the kind of number that x can be. So are we talking about whole numbers? Are we talking about decimals? Are we talking about fractions? So in this case, we're talking about any possible decimal, right? So the name for the set of numbers that could be written as any kind of decimal are, is called the real numbers. Does that sound familiar? You guys have heard of the real numbers, I hope. So the symbol we use to represent the real numbers is this R with the two vertical lines. So this symbol here reads is a member of, and this symbol here is the symbol for the real numbers. So basically what we're saying is this is the set of all the real numbers between 100 and 200. And as we demonstrated earlier, that is clearly an infinite set because you can just keep expanding that decimal out, adding another zero, you know, or any number for in the decimal, and you're going to have something that never ends, a list that never ends. Everybody agree with that? Okay. In terms of this course... I would not expect you to be able to generate that whole cloth on your own. What I would expect you to be able to do is to read that and give me examples of things that are in that set. So in this case, you could write 137 is a member of that set, right? So that's what I would expect you to be able to do is to read that, understand what it means, and be able to give me examples of members of that set, I would not expect you from a description to be able to come up with that notation on your own. Okay? So just to be clear, you should be able to read it and understand what it means, but to go the other direction is not an expectation for you. Is that okay there? Okay. All right. Um, Questions about sets or how to write um, an infinite or finite set? Obviously, again, the infinite ones you don't need to be able to write yourself. You would be able, I would expect you to be able to generate examples of things in that set, though. Okay. Uh, the next definition that I want to do is something called a relation. So we say that a relation is a set of ordered pairs created by pairing members of a set D that we call the domain with members of a set R, we call that set the range. When I write ordered pairs, what am I really talking about here? I'm talking about points, like x comma y's. Is everybody okay there? So let's do a little bit of notation.
So a relation is a set, so I would name it with a capital letter. I'm going to choose to use the capital letter C to name this relation. And then let's say our set contains uh, four ordered pairs. We'll say 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and 4, 4. So I will write my curly bracket to show that it's a set. And then I can just list those four ordered pairs that I just described aloud. And then I can close this set with another curly bracket. This is another example of a finite set. This set contains four, has four members, because there's four ordered pairs in this set. Is everybody okay with that idea? Okay. Not surprising, a relation could also be infinite. It could contain an infinite number of ordered pairs. Most of us should remember from geometry last year, how many points are on any line or any line segment? Well, that's how many you need to be able to draw it. But how many points do they contain? Infinite, right? There's infinitely many points on a line segment. Do you remember that? That was an axiom, I think, from geometry. At least it should sound familiar. Like you'll buy that, that along a line segment there's infinitely many points. You need two of the points to be able to draw a line that passes that contains that line segment. But if you're actually trying to count how many points there are, there's infinitely many. So if we have infinitely many points, we're going to use that infinite set notation. So the members of a relation aren't just x's. They look like ordered pairs. So I'm going to have like an xy here. And then maybe the points that I'm interested in are the ones that are on the line y equals x. Okay with that idea? And maybe I'm just interested in the whole number points on that line y equals x. So like 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, 7, negative 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 2, negative 3, negative 3, etc. Those kind of numbers that are whole numbered, negative and positive, have a special name. Does anybody remember the name that we give to those kind of numbers? Start with an I. Integer is correct. Good pull. So let's say that these X and Ys are members of, and the symbol we use to write the integers is this one. So again, this symbol was such that. I know it's a lot of symbols. Again, my expectation is not that you're able to write one of these infinite sets yourself out of whole cloth. It's that you're able to read this and be able to give me examples of things in that set. Or be able to tell me if something is in that set or not in that set. Yes. Uh, sure. So this is basically like the letter E, if you just curve it. That's okay. That's not a stupid question. Like, you've never seen the symbol before. I know my penship, penmanship is not tip-top. Yeah, it's basically like the letter, capital letter E, if you curve it. Yes. Okay. So... What, they're, what it's saying is my set contains xy's, and the way I find those xy's is with this rule, okay. is what it's saying. So it's like, what do the members of the set look like, and then how do I find those members? What 
this one here. So I have to make clear like what kind of numbers these things can be. So I'm saying that my x and y's are integers. So they're positive or negative whole numbers. Does that make sense? So what we're saying is if I try to write out this set, I'd have like an ellipsis there. Like the members of my set would be things that look like this. That's what that information is really telling us. So that's what the members would look like. Would be these positive or negative whole number pairs. Does that make sense? Questions about relations? Okay. okay. The next thing I want to do is define the focus of this lesson, which is fun a function. So a function is a relation where every member of the domain pairs with exactly one member of the range. So a quick aside before we do any examples of functions. So functions and relations are related in one way, in some way because every function is a relation, right? Everybody's okay with that idea? Part of the definition? Which one is there more of? Functions or relations? Okay, let me let me rephrase the let me ask a different question first then. Let's say we're talking about dogs and mammals. Every dog is a mammal, right? Which one is there more of? Mammals. Okay. Every function is a relation. Which one is there more of? Relations, right? So if we think about it as like a picture, if this is all the relations, inside of that is all the functions. So there are some relations that are not functions, but every function is a relation. And you saw this kind of thing in geometry last year when you talked about like quadrilaterals, right? Where every square is a parallelogram, but not every parallelogram is a square. You saw this kind of set and subset relationship there as well. So just to kind of give you a picture of how these two things are related. Does that make sense? Good. Good. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do now is we're going to talk about different ways to represent a relation, and we'll do some examples of those and decide whether they're functions or not. Okay? So the first way that we're going, or that we have to represent a relation, is with something called a mapping diagram. What a mapping diagram looks like is it's going to be two ovals. The first oval 
represents the domain, and the second oval represents the range. What we'll do then is we'll write in the members of the domain inside of that oval. So maybe this domain contains the numbers 1, 7, negative 3, and 5. And then we'll do the same thing in the range, where we'll write in the numbers that are the members of the range. And then what we'll do is we're going to draw arrows from the members of the domain to the members of the range that indicate the pairings. So let's say that maybe 1 is paired with negative 10, 7 is paired with 1, negative 3 is paired with 0, and 5 is paired with 6. So this is an example of a way to represent a relation. The question that we're going to ask is, is this relation a function? So there's two things that we have to check in our definition, right? The first thing we have to do is check that everything in the domain is used. So if I look at my domain, I notice the 1 is paired with something, 7 is paired with something, negative 3 is paired with something, and 5 is paired with something. So that part of the definition is satisfied, right? The second part of the definition says that they have to be paired with exactly one member of the range. So if I look here again, the 1 is paired with just negative 10. That's good. The 7 is paired with just 1. Negative 3 is paired with just 0. And 5 is paired with just 16. So I would say that this is a function. Okay? I'm going to erase the arrows now and redraw them in different locations and ask another question about whether this is a function or not. So I'm just going to change the color to green and we'll write our answers here in green. So this is a new relation. I've just redraw, redrawn something different. Is this representing a, a function? No. What's, what's wrong? Good. Yeah, every element of the domain isn't used because the 5 isn't going anywhere. So we'd say that this is not a function. We'll do now one in purple. How about this? Is this a function? Well, let's check. If I look, every member is used. Everybody agree with that? Yeah. Every member of the domain is used. 1 goes to just 0. 7 goes to just 0. Negative 3 goes to just 1. And 5 goes to just 16. So this is a function. Did it matter that not all of the range was used? No. Did it matter that some of the range was used more than once? No. The only thing we really need to look at are the domains or the x's, right? So we only need to look at that part. Let's do one more example, and then we'll move on to the next representation. Yes, of course. So let's look at this one. Does this represent a function? Okay, good. No, why not? Perfect, because the 7 is going to two different places. This is not 
a function. And I think that covers the diff, like all the different ways that this could kind of look. Everybody okay with that? All right. Um, next one we'll look at is a set of ordered pairs. So in this situation, do we need to worry about the every element or every member of the domain is used? No, because we're not really told what the domain is anyways. So we can just assume that that part is satisfied. What we still need to check, though, is that the exactly one member of the range part. We still need to look there. So is this a function? No is the correct answer. Why not? Go ahead, sir. Very good. So we have the domain of three that is going to two different ranges. It, the three is going to negative five, and it's going to negative ten. Did it matter that the negative... Oops that the negative 5 is paired with two different x's? No, the y's do not matter. We're only worried about the x's. Do we feel okay with the set of ordered pairs? Basically, all we're doing is looking for repeated x's, right? That's the cut and dry there. Yes? So there's two x's in the Correct. Um, what else? What did I say? Uh, oh, I haven't done anything. Okay. Let's say a graph. So a graph is a collection of ordered pairs, right? Because it's just a bunch of points. So this is definitely a relation. The question is, is this relation representing a function or not? You say, yes, it is a function? Okay. And that's correct. Because if you notice, if I pick a given x value, there's only one point that corresponds to that. The way that we talk about using or checking that is something called a vertical line test. And what the vertical line test says is if you can draw any vertical line that intersects the graph more than once, then that graph does not represent a function. If I look at this graph that I've drawn here, no matter where I draw a vertical line, it only crosses the graph one time. I can't draw a vertical line that's going to get it twice. I could draw a horizontal line, but that's not what this is needs. I need a vertical line. So this one is a function. Let's look at another example here. How about a circle? Is this a function? No, right? There's lots of vertical lines I could draw that intersect the graph at least once. This is not a function. Do we feel comfortable with these graphing ones? Typically this is usually, students do well with these. It's very visual and your intuition is usually pretty good on these sorts of things, right? The vertical line test helps that we have a nice name for what to do to check also.
the last way that will you or that will represent a function is with an equation. So let's say our equation is y equals 3x plus 5. This, is this a function? Okay, some people said no, some people said yes. Let's want a useful way to kind of check this if you're not really sure is thinking about what its graph would look like. So what would the graph of y equals 3x plus 5 look like? A, like a diagonal line, right? Is that going to pass a vertical line test? Yes. So we should say this is a function. Everybody okay with that idea? Okay. What about something like this? X squared plus Y squared equals 4. What does this graph look like? You should recognize this from last year in geometry. It's not a parabola. This is a circle. This is the graph of a circle. So you learned in geometry last year that the equation of a circle is going to be x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So that's if we have a both an x squared and a y squared. What we're talking about is a circle. What can we say about a circle? Not a function. Now, if you didn't recognize that as a circle, one way that we can do this is we can do a little bit of algebra here. Let's try to rearrange this to get the y by itself. If I wanted to get the y by itself, what could I do first? Subtract the x squared to the other side. Okay. And then what would I need to do? Square root both sides of my equation. When I square root both sides of an equation, what happens? Uh, well, in this case, the square isn't going to go away. Well, the square goes away on the left side, yes. But when I do it to both sides of an equation, something special happens. What? It doesn't become 2. You get a plus or minus. So... If you think about it this way, how many different numbers can I square to get 4? 2 and negative 2, right? Negative 2 times negative 2 is also 4. So whenever you're square rooting both sides of an equation, you generate a plus or minus because there's two answers to that question. So if I were then to try to make an xy table, to graph this, maybe I pick 0 for x. When I plug 0 in to figure out what the y is, I get two answers. I get positive 2 or negative 2. So what I see here is I have an x that goes to two different y's. You could justify this as being not a function with that method as well. And this is nice because it doesn't require you to recognize that this thing was a circle. So if you didn't recognize that, you can always just try to get the y by itself, algebraically, and then try to plug in some values for x and see if you get two y values as a result. Okay? My suggestion is you pick more than one x, just in case. If we had picked... 4 for x, you'd have been getting just one y value, so you have to be a little bit careful. My suggestion is to try more than one x 
two or three is usually sufficient. Uh, or until you get a duplicate. In this case where I got one X that gave me two Y's, I could stop immediately. I don't need to do more than one. But if you're suspicious that you, if you're not sure that this is a function right away, my suggestion if you're getting a single X value is maybe you try one or two more just to be certain. Or just collecting a little bit more evidence. Um, is everybody okay with that idea? All right. Um, there's one other common situation where you can have something, an equation that's not a function that I would expect you to recognize. That is the situation where you're just talking about a vertical line. Does anybody remember how we, or remember how we write the equation for a vertical line? Yes, sir. Yeah. So if I had like x equals 5, that's the equation for a vertical line. Notice that I have just an x and no y with it. So if I were to create an ordered pair or an xy table here, the x is always going to be 5. It doesn't tell me how to find my y, so the y could be whatever it wants. So in fact, here we have the x value paired with many different y's. It's not just one or two. It's like infinitely many different y's to that single x value. But it's not a function, exactly. That would be a situation where I'd expect, again, you could recognize it just from the form. But if you didn't recognize it, you could always try to make an xy table. And in this case, you can see really quickly that you have many y's all to the same x. Right. Um, probably time to stop here. I did.